we're going to get started. I'm going to do a little welcome here to set the stage. And then we've got a great program for you. I'm really excited um, for the evening and appreciate those of you tuning in who, who aren't getting credit. Um, so just quickly, what is a policy practicum? Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is a, a relatively new um, curricular activity at the law school modeled after law clinics, but where uh, the client and the student teams are working on issues of policy. Uh, and that's what we're here today to explore and discuss. We've been focusing this spring's policy practicum on structuring effective carbon markets. Um, do keep in mind, you know, at the end of the day, this is a class. Our, you know, we have two goals here. Our first goal is education. Um, so I think and hope the students have learned a lot over the course of this quarter. We have learned from them. I hope you will learn something this evening. Um, and then our second goal is, is impact. You know, we want this work to matter. We want to be advancing the field of practice with new ideas, innovations, uh, diagnoses of, of what's broken. So uh, we hope we accomplish both this evening. Do keep in mind though that they are, they are dual objectives. Um, we threw our students into the deep end uh, this quarter, as we uh, like to do. Uh, so this is, you know, this is the, the, the frontier of practice, the, the thorniest of the thorny problems that are holding back the scaling up of the voluntary carbon market. Uh, our students, our graduate students, they have, um, many of them have been practitioners in these markets um, or come with other market or, or science backgrounds that gave them a head start to swim in the deep end. Um, so we're excited for them to be able to share their uh, learning and their recommendations. And then just to kind of level set on substance, where we started from is, um, is the voluntary carbon market or you'll, VCM, I'll do an acronym kind of preview here too, framework, which is um, you know, of the moment where the VCM is trying to fix itself through these various integrity, and I use that in quotes, initiatives that are trying to bring integrity through the lens of, of, of terms like permanence, additionality, leakage, or this kind of concern of a race to the bottom with credits. This is the same conversation we've been having for three decades in the trading of carbon credits. Um, we have not yet found paths out of those eddies. Um, and, and our hypothesis at SFI and the Steyer Taylor Center is that we're not asking the more fundamental questions of market integrity. What's the accounting? What's the science of measurement? What are property rights and legal frameworks? What's the market structure and capital structures and trading infrastructure? And then what, what's regu what does regulation look like in the role of government? And so that's been the investigation and the journey of this quarter. And into that soup, we have, we have put two big ideas, which you're gonna hear about tonight um, and their implications. And the, and the first big idea is actually more evolutionary than revolutionary. It's this, it's, the idea of carbon accounting and moving from this system we have now with the greenhouse gas protocol that counts carbon in the parlance of scopes into a system that accounts for carbon in the parlance of cost accounting <laughs> that, that has been tried and true for, for centuries. Uh, and that, that's a fundamental shift that again is more evolutionary than revolutionary, but that's, a big, that's one big idea. The second big idea, which is even bigger, is this concept of emissions liability management or ELM. And that is a framework within which carbon can be managed. And its basic thesis or premise is, you know, is that with these li emissions liabilities or e-liabilities that can then be measured using real accounting, firms have an obligation to uh, match those long duration liabilities with duration matched assets. And that is the foundation on which what we know of as carbon markets today might thrive and evolve, uh, which is to say uh, it creates a, a, a rational structure for carbon removals, price discovery for carbon removals, and brings the whole suite of activities around avoided emissions into uh, uh, business as usual investment decision making for firms and, and asset owners uh, to invest in decarbonizing their supply chains as long as that investment is less expensive than the price to permanently remove their liabilities, which is, which is their alternative. So within the, that kind of VCM um, 
framework. We have introduced these two big ideas of carbon accounting and emissions liability management. You will hear a lot more about it. I'm going to leave it there with just the little table setting I did. A little bit on structure. I sent this in the email. We've got um, five teams, um, six, one, two, three, four, five, six teams that are going to be running through to different durations, summer 20, summer 10, depending if they're individuals or groups. Um, we're going to cover the state of insurance. We're going to cover um, uh, MMRV. We're going to cover the science of carbon management. We're going to do two case studies, one, one on the, what we call the coal problem, the other on what we call the tree problem. Uh, and then we're going to look at the supply capacity and, and legal frameworks. Tom is going to wrap us up for the last 15 minutes. As I said, we will keep time. I promise you that. Um, what you probably don't see in here is questions. Um, where do you ask them and how? Um, the student teams have prepared their presentations in the time allotted. They have not prepared them for, for Q&A in each session. So please ask questions in the chat. We will, the teaching team will be capturing them, advancing them. We will either address them in the wrap up or we will send them back to the teams at the end. But we're going to run through these presentations uh, without interruption. And we, but we do want to hear from you. So that's how we will capture your questions. We can also follow up after the session uh, if we don't get to it. And so with that, and in the spirit of keeping us on time, I'm going to turn us over to our state of insurance um, team. OK, excellent. Well, thank you so much for the time and for joining this call. Uh, so today, we want to speak to you about insurance in the VCM space. But before we delve into it, to set some context, think of anything, uh, think about your life, think of any major asset that you own, whether that be your home, whether that be your own health, a cell phone, you are able to go out and buy insurance for it today to cover for any loss, damage, and be reimbursed for it in some shape or form. So the premise for us is why is it that for a market of this kind, there is no well-versed insurance product out there. There are just a handful of firms out there that offer insurance, and that also very bespoke. You're not able to pick and choose the kind of losses that are covered, but rather you have to take what the insurance products offer. So our goal was threefold. Julia, Adam, and I uh, sought to understand first, what's the state of insurance industry? Second, to understand structural deficiencies in the frameworks, the VCM frameworks, and also in the insurance industry. And to understand, have some understanding of what needs to structurally happen to actually see some uh, insurance products come through. So to kick things off, I just want to talk briefly about why insurance. Well, uh, some of the trends in the VCM space that you are familiar with are first, it's a growing market. People often quote the ecosystem marketplace report, which say that the market is worth 2 billion. I actually feel that's a gross understatement. If you see most of the markets in the world, the size is based on notional traded. And most of the trading in this actually happens on OTC markets, like platforms like Expansive. The market, if you follow that trend in 2022, did not shrink, it actually went up. It's just the credits are far more, uh, change hands more often. The second is price divergence. For the same type of credits, you see a wide range of prices between eight and $80, depending on the kind of project. And you see that actually increasing because of the fragmentation of marketplaces. The third is heightened focus on quality. Uh, this is not new, but increasingly all the press coverage has been negative around carbon credits, which has made corporate buyers often think about quality. And obviously there is no uniform definition. People speak of permanence and additionality, but you can't actually point to anything um, that is universally agreed upon. And lastly, lastly, there's no rocket science, but climate change itself is exacerbating reversal. So forests that would have remained standing were it not for climate change are increasingly being burned down. So the credits become a little worthless. And why does this matter for insurance? The first is that, of, of course, as uh, the market grows, the ability to actually have risk transfer allows uh, increased participation. You know, any corporate would want to make sure that if they buy an asset, there is an ability to transfer the risk of anything going wrong. Um, so that's why insurance matters. Second, if you look at historically markets like commodities markets that I'm familiar with, pricing actually, insurance actually sends a very strong pricing signal. The premium that you are charged for actually has a lot of informational value when it comes to pricing, even for commodities that may not be directly fungible. It, I think that it serves as a strong indicator and same is true in carbon. Three, uh, it is just perceived all else equal. If you have insurance on a credit, it's considered higher quality. So that's why insurance is important. And the last one is 
in the event of a reversal, currently there is no financial reversal, uh, financial flow reversal that happens. So it leads to perverse incentives that are not good for the market. Now, I just want to briefly touch upon the structural deficiencies in existing frameworks. The first one is in the current framework, emission liabilities are extinguished the moment you retire a credit. So I don't need to elaborate on that, but that is how the frameworks are established today. The emissions liabilities do not live forever. Second, assets and liabilities are actually just matched on quantum, not on duration. So if you have a liability, you emit one ton, you are able to buy a credit for a ton, and then they offset each other, even though the asset may be from something that's short-lived, but the liability, the CO2 you put in the air lives forever. But that's how assets and liabilities are dealt with today. The third one is the, the view of emissions really is, if you look at the financial statement point of view, it, they are treated from an income statement kind of lens, which is periodical. First January to 31st of December, you wipe the slate clean and you restart from zero. Whereas emissions, because they're actually permanent, the view that we actually need is more of a balance sheet view. And if you see the way the net zero works today, you have a certain amount of emissions, you buy certain credits, uh, the resultant is what your net emissions are. And then 1st January comes in and you wipe the slate clean. It actually detracts from the holistic emission that a firm has put in the, into the atmosphere and the current BCM frameworks perpetuate that view. Fourth is buffer pools are treated in insurance, but buffer pools are actually not capitalized like insurance companies. Most insurance companies are required by the respective regulator to hold capital to actually absorb losses. And there is actually nothing underpinning the buffer pools besides the actual credits that sit in there. And the last is something that we all know, but offset registries have a significant conflict of interest. They are the asset generators and also the protectors. And those are two important roles that should actually be segregated. That leads to perverse incentives. Vera makes money by issuing credits, regardless of the quality. So at this point, I'll just pass it to Julia to talk about other things. Hi, everyone. Um, so just uh, stepping over now, now that we've covered some of the issues around um, the VCM in general, um, we started looking at some of the structural challenges for insurance in this market. And I think there are a couple of um, main points that came out throughout this research, some of which are um, somewhat related, but I think still important to, to separate out. Um, the first um, is that we're still facing a nascent um, a state of you know certain carbon removal processes. So what this means is that while we may have good information on some types of carbon removal, we don't have good information on all types of carbon removal. So there's kind of a challenge in terms of really understanding the science behind it and the data behind that, um, which then leads to the fact that insurers uh, struggle to develop really methodologies for these many different types of removals that they gain some sort of comfort on. Um, and then that, you know, Relatedly to this point on data is this idea that for insurers, the underwriting models really depend on a strong history of losses, reversals, all the types of risks for them to be able to model out um, all of these components. For insurers, competitive advantage really comes from the fact from their underwriting models themselves. Um, and so this lack of data or rather lack of confidence around this data, because some could argue that the data does exist, um, is what leads to kind of very conservative behavior um, around ensuring carbon credits. Um, related to that is also this idea that the obligations are long term. Um, and even if we think about the longest term insurance that we have, perhaps life insurance, uh, the, the types of products that we're thinking about here uh, would at a minimum be a uh, you know, 100 year timeline. Um, which also further complicates or puts this in the territory of, of, of unknown or uncertain types of products for incumbents. Um, and then uh, as a result of all of these factors, you have a situation in which uh, the capital at risk, you know, the, the capital that insurers have to set aside for different types of risks to match um, these uncertainties and this volatility can make these models um, uneconomical. So we uh, heard of a case where that was as high as 40%. So imagine if you were insuring $100 million worth of carbon credits, you would have to set aside something like $40 million for that capital at risk. So that really um, kind of puts into perspective how all the previous factors that I mentioned contribute to a really difficult economic decision. And all of that, I guess, um, and perhaps most important uh, as a result of all of this is that you see 
um, current insurers are the incumbents when we think about the big balance sheet players um, and are therefore largely conservative to innovation. And to some extent that even makes sense given that carbon, uh, we mentioned it's a $2 billion market and yes, uh, it's growing, but that really only represents a tiny percentage of their portfolios today compared to the por por portfolio of life insurance and other types of products. So even from a business perspective of them um, kind of internally uh, dedicating resources and uh, capital to this is, is difficult to just justify in, in house. Um, so that's kind of the, the general big picture. We try to um, put some faces to the people who are trying to um, build out VCM insurance products. And here we kind of present a, a brief uh, summary of those. I think the first message here is that there aren't many. For the reasons that I mentioned on the previous slide, the large incumbents are largely not interested in, in entering this market. So what you have is startups um, increasingly trying to operate this space or sometimes kind of one-off partnerships, as you see with Howden and Respira, offering um, some products on a kind of pilot basis. Um, we put together this matrix really to try and demonstrate first also for us uh, to understand the insurance market a little bit better. You have um, on the x-axis really the, the spectrum of players that are um, MGAs or in other words intermediaries, um, so they don't hold the risk on their balance sheet. They're really um, maybe just specialized in, in certain ways, but they depend on a large insurer um, for that balance sheet to be able to insure these products all the way to full stack. So companies that are trying to um, and um, provide also the balance sheet mechanisms to, to ensure the risk. Um, the difference, if you look at kind of the spectrum between these two, if you're depending on a large insurer for your balance sheet, you will quickly be um, forced in many ways to operate under more conservative products for all the reasons that we mentioned earlier. Whereas if you're going more the full stack route, you have all that risk on your own balance sheet. And so suddenly it becomes, the main challenge becomes really understanding the market, really understanding price um, and, and gaining confidence around that. So that's the x-axis. On the y-axis, we also discovered that there's quite a big divergence in terms of what people are actually insuring. So um, on the kind of most macro level, we have um, certificate insurance uh, at the bottom of the y-axis here. So these are really players that are looking at um, providing insurance to the certificate that's been given. And what that really means in, in the most simplistic terms um, is making sure that uh, this it kind of covers fraud, counterparty risk, um, reputation, et cetera. It is somewhat removed for many of the things we've already dis discussed in class from the actual carbon of that project. Um, so that's kind of an important distinction that we found talking to some of these players. And then at the top of the y-axis, you have what we're calling here carbon insurance or the actual insurance of the carbon credit that at least in terms of a goal of, or of an effort, insurers are trying to insure the actual carbon stored in a given project, which is different from insuring the certificate of carbon being stored in a project. And that kind of lays out a little bit the... Um, the lay of the land in terms of the different players. Um, and so to kind of summarize that, in terms of the conversations we were having with people trying to seek solutions to this, three things came out. First was the mutualized risk model, um, which really is an effort to pool risk. Um, so I guess perhaps the most simplified, to, simplified way to think about this would be if we took buffer pools today and kind of pull them all together and had 100 different projects together, um, what would that look like? This is a model that's used by um, the shipping industry uh, historically that had um, a lot of open-ended risks that they didn't know how to insure. And so then they kind of pulled these risks together as a means to, to cover those open-ended risks. We have more on that uh, in our report if, if people are interested. The second um, is this concept of insurance wrappers. So this is really trying to have the sale of the carbon credit itself directly tied to an insurance wrapper so that when you buy a carbon credit, you also buy it already with an insurance tied to it. Here, as we mentioned earlier, this is really within an, uh, an objective to ensure the carbon that is being stored 
Um, and Aka is one of the players in this space that is really seeking to ensure everything from fraud all the way to methodology change to project uh, to carbon reversal. And then finally, um, you have more macro policies that I mentioned earlier. These are, you know, the Kitas of the world, more of the intermediaries that are trying to provide partial co coverage for certain aspects of the VCM risk profile um, that are not tied directly to um, the carbon credits themselves. But I'll stop here because that's a lot of information and pass on to Adam. Thanks very much, Julia. So how does ELM help with, with this? Well, a, a lot of it's got to do with the fact liabilities will be recorded and will be uh, kept on the balance sheet. And as a result of that, that'll create a market demand and a discipline in the market, which will then enable uh, a number of different attributes to occur, which will then also enable better pricing of the risk. So if we think about that for a second, the uh, you know, it will drive duration matching. Um, it's going to require duration matching. So rather than having annual uh, annual targets offsetting long dated liabilities, you're going to be able to, you'll, you'll need a, a, a mismatch or you'll need a match of that rather than having the mismatch, which is the way obviously banks are funded under different types of, um, under different types of capital adequacy ratios. Uh, recording these liabilities on a balance sheet will provide a much better view of the overall risk picture of a particular corporate. And again, looking at the duration of that will then encourage uh, better pricing both by the corporates and or better understanding of the risk by the corporates and better pricing by the insurers. Uh, and finally, all of that should then lead to a better uh, ability to build a forward market um, and to hold less capital against the requirements for building a forward market. Um, and where do we go from here? Well, the what we need to do is, a, you know, really sort of categorize and calibrate the different types of credits that would be part of this market. So avoidance, uh, time weighted and permanent removals uh, and see how those then offset these long dated liability. Uh, insurers are gonna have to start modeling some of the newer, some of the newer risks such as uh, what Zimbabwe did recently, things like nationalization and somehow take that into account when it comes to pricing these risks. Um, we're going to have to dig into some of the other models and the more innovative ideas that Julia came up with, the mutualized risk models, insurance wrappers, and, the, and those annual insurance policies. Uh, and then finally, um, we're going to need to do uh, more research onto, uh, into the risk-based charges to make sure that the insurance is viable um, and that there's a, a, a sound economic model here. Great. So Thank you. I guess we have a couple of minutes for questions. I don't know if anyone has any anything burning or we. Fantastic. I can't see the gallery, but if, it, if anyone has a question, we do have a couple minutes here. Let's see now. Any questions from the gallery? We've solved insurance. We've solved it, yeah. <laughs> Great presentation. Uh, and we will take the time. We'll keep moving. Thank you, Pawan, Julia. Thank you. I think Pawan and I will now have to step off because we have class. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry that we'll be missing the rest of the presentations, but hopefully they'll there be. And Adam, and thank you, Adam. Are you, and I don't know if Adam has to jump too, but thank you all. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you. All right. So we've got our VCM, ELM, and MMRB acronym soup team up next. Great. Uh, I think that uh, I, I can kick us off. So uh, as, as Alicia said, we're the alphabet soup team. We wanted to think about uh, the way that MMRV is going to be playing a role in the future carbon markets and how that plays into uh, and how MMRV will tie into ELM. So what we have taken away from our, from our research is that basically avoidance credits are making up the voluntary carbon market in the minute and at the moment, but they're going to take on a new role as we take on the paradigm shift to ELM. Basically, uh, the avoidance credits will take on a role by limiting liabilities of projects uh, and thus requiring fewer removal assets to cancel them out. We'll talk more about that in depth, so fear not. Uh, second is that 
Well, ELM focuses on removal credits as an asset. Basically, we need those, uh, MMRV is going to underlie any carbon removal asset that is taking place in the market. So basically, because so many different project types are so different across engineered and nature-based solutions, MMRV is going to have to set a level playing field for the different types of removals that are in the market. And although progress is being made, there's still a lot of work to be done uh, to solve the MMRV bottleneck. And with that, I will pass it off to Bennett. Amazing. Thank you, Cam. Um, so I'll start by just highlighting some of the uh, recent challenges in the carbon markets. Um, if you flip to the next page, it's no secret that there's been a lot of negative press recently around uh, carbon credits in particular. Um, there was a pretty bombshell report not a couple weeks ago about Vera uh, and their practice of verifying uh, rainforest carbon offsets. 90% uh, were proven to be virtually worthless, some with more harm to the environment than actual good. Um, this resulted in a spiral of concerns that eventually brought about the uh, uh, the retirement of the of the then Vera CEO and uh, major changes announced from Vera to their methodology for forest-based carbon offsets. Now, while this is certainly one example of this challenge, it is uh, it is more exa an example of some underlying challenges in the carbon market broadly. If you move to the next page, Cam. Amazing. Um, this is just like I mentioned, a symptom of, of broader challenges in the carbon market. In particular, these fall into three core buckets. First is a crisis of confidence in verification bodies. Um, we've seen this already with some other news about Vera, but increasingly there's this view that carbon uh, verifiers are behind the times using outdated methodologies to uh, evaluate carbon credits and that there is real concern around whether these credits have viable impact on the climate or if they're uh, greenwashing, for lack of a better word. This leads to uncertainty around the efficacy of carbon classes, in particular avoidance versus removal. Um, there's not a clear understanding across a lot of the market about what the difference between these two is, and that has led to challenges both for corporate buyers of these credits and also for those trying to understand the impact of the carbon markets on um, the climate more broadly. And this is all really driven by the lack of a reliable system to account for and ensure against the risks associated with some of these carbon credits. In particular, uh, a lacking of an ability to account for avoidance credits um, and uh, a system that is focused not on maintaining a balanced registry of carbon, but rather uh, purchasing and then retiring credits without a consideration for the duration of the carbon emitted into the atmosphere or the duration of the credit associated with those um, carbon liabilities. So that brings us to, um, oh, sorry, this is illustrated in the market as it stands today. Um, as, as Cam mentioned at the top today, avoidance credits compose the vast majority of the voluntary carbon market, over 80%, the vast majority of these driven by uh, nature-based avoidances, uh, much like those that Vera had uh, verifi verified uh, and that has come over fi under fire recently, and also renewable energy credits, which is effectively issuing credits uh, to fund renewable energy projects and claiming that they avoid emissions. But the problem with these credits is, again, that they rely on these counterfactuals. There's no way to prove that they're actually avoiding emissions. In, uh, instead, often they use a baseline of made up otherwise emissions to account for these credits, which cannot actually be matched to a real avoidance. And that brings us to ELM. Um, Really, emissions liability management is about replacing traditional carbon accounting systems with a system of emissions liabilities, which companies can then match to verified carbon assets. How this works in practice is in a year, a company might emit 100 tons of CO2, for example, from their operations. Um, at the end of that year or across the year, the company will purchase uh, carbon assets, that is carbon removals, whether nature-based or tech-based, um, to balance their carbon liabilities. Um, now, these carbon assets um, could have different durations, as already mentioned. So, for example, nature-based solutions may have shorter-term durations uh, than tech-based removals, which may have a longer horizon. Um, and then the, these company, this company will then balance those assets against their liabilities. Um, over time, uh, as the company moves through different years, uh, their nature-based solution or removals, for example, may depreciate. Um, this accounts for some of the risk associated with nature-based removals, and a company can then purchase additional um, removals to, in, to 
continually balance their uh, historical emissions and solve the problem of uh, the duration of these carbon assets. Um, this solves a couple of the key problems in the system. If you move to the next page, Cam. Um, first, avoidance credits are now incorporated through the limitations of liabilities. Instead of saying that you know a credit is worth one, mil one metric ton based off an imaginary baseline, avoidances are now incorporated into a liability, reducing the amount of emissions that a, co uh, a company puts out rather than balancing them against the emissions that a company has emitted. The second is by addressing the problem of duration for, for these carbon credits. Now, nature-based credits or shorter term credits can act as bridges, uh, allowing a company to continually renew and balance their uh, carbon balance sheets while uh, holding for a transition to longer term assets, or uh, in the case of not wanting to move to longer term assets, allowing them to consistently renew with uh, shorter duration solutions to balance their, li uh, their emissions liabilities. The third um, is by recognizing the longer duration of some tech-based removals and having those act as constant balances against some sort of carbon liability while not striking them from the history of the company, instead acting as consistent long-term balancing to their uh, emissions liabilities. And then the last um, is by reflecting cumulative emissions from the company, which allows a real approach to net zero. Um, it shows the full history of a company's emissions and the full history of their associated removals as well, um, allowing companies to really achieve net zero um, in a meaningful sense across the history of a company, not just in a theoretical sense. Um, this is just, this is a critical, but critically underpinning this entire process is a, a system of measuring, monitoring, reporting, and verifying these carbon assets. Um, in order to ensure that carbon assets durations are properly matched against carbon liabilities, you need a clear understanding of um, the ability of these credits to um, properly balance against CO2 emitted and for what time horizon they can do that. And we see our team, MMRV, as a critical part underpinning the, pro uh, the process of tra the transition to ELM. And I'm going to pass it over to Cam to discuss some of the MMRV strategies used in tech removals. Great. I hope everyone can hear me now. Thank you, Bennett, for that lovely pass off. So when we're talking about technology-based removals, uh, let's see, can I click through now? Basically, when we're talking about any you know, tech-based removals in particular, a life cycle analysis is going to be a baseline upon which any tech-based removal can be issued. Basically, for a given project, there might be emissions associated with building out, for instance, a direct air capture plant or building out a uh, an ocean alkalinity enhancement uh, project, there will be associated emissions with building that project. And basically any uh, carbon removal asset or carbon credit that is issued by this firm must be on a net basis. We see this happening in the, in the marketplace as it is. We see if you take a look at any purchase agreements that are done by Stripe or Frontier, uh, all of the credits that are purchased are on a net removal basis. So basically, we'll have life cycle assessments, which you know, carbon accounting firms tend to be able to you know, capture many of those. If you look at the likes of Watershed, they can take all of the different inputs, all of the different procurements, all of the different purchase orders to set that baseline for the life cycle. But then you have to figure out what, those, what, the, uh, act, what is actually being removed so that net removal credits can be issued. So basically, when we come into the removal side, it's there's going to be MMRB to ensure that the right number of credits are actually being issued. So, but one of the issues is that even within a specific carbon removal pathway, let's say ocean alkalinity enhancement, there is going to be many different firms doing many different things. From conversations I've had this week, for instance, uh, speaking with folks at the likes of Ebb Carbon. So they use an electrochemical process to add alkalinity to the ocean. They're, I'm not going to go into the, the, the details of it, but basically they use electrochemistry to create alkalinity that's then added to the ocean, and the alk alkalinity is measured because uh, the alkalinity allows the ocean to, to draw down additional CO2. However, planetary technology, they use low carbon alkaline materials and add those to the ocean, but alkalinity, and when the alkalinity is added to the ocean, it is then measured. But even though these two companies are functionally following the exact same pathway, adding alkalinity to the ocean, they're following wildly different MMRV protocols. The sensors they're using are different. The 
places that they're taking their measurements of alkalinity are different. So basically there's no uniformity because, uh, because there's no incentive to, uh, there's no incentive to actually have a uniform approach. And why is this the case? Uh, I found myself asking, our team found ourselves asking, and like, let's look at these one-off buyers. We have Stripe as a part of the Frontier Coalition. We have Microsoft. We have recently JP Morgan Chase. These are some of the largest buyers of uh, engineered carbon removal credits. And it's very nascent. And basically, if you take a look, Stripe and Frontier, looking at their site, for every project that they're reviewing, they have over 50 reviewers. They're taking the foremost scientists in the space and doing due diligence on every purchase that they're making. You see, 50 reviewers right there. They have the list. But basically, this model isn't going to be scalable if the market is going to reach a climate impactful scale. These are one-off purchases. These are very well-resourced well organizations. But if everyone is adopting a, if everyone has to adopt ELM, they can't, they, not every organization is going to be able to afford a group of 50 reviewers to diligence every single carbon removal purchase that they're making. So basically, all of these different technologies are going to have different methodologies to measure carbon removal. For instance, with direct air capture, where CO2 is sucked directly from the air and either stored in geological formations or utilized, there's a risk of physical leakage when we're measuring capture. It's easy to measure the tailpipe and understand how much CO2 is being sequestered in the subsurface. But once it's underground, there's no way there, there needs to be a uniform way of measuring uh, whether or not it's leaking, whether or not the, the CO2 is being mineralized. There has to be some uniformity across direct air capture technologies and storage technologies to understand how much CO2 is actually being sequestered. In direct ocean capture, where CO2 is sucked directly from the ocean to increase the ocean's ability to sequester carbon, there's a risk that CO2 depleted water sinks immediately. And that, that CO2, and as a result, it might take years for that the atmospheric drawdown to actually occur. Yet there's no and amongst the firms who are doing that, there's no standardization of where they should be measuring the water, where should it be input there. And, you know, with a wide open system like the ocean, like there are so much, there are many considerations like water temperature, the extent to which it's mixing, anything like that. Ocean alkalinity enhancement, I touched a little bit, is that when alkalinity is added to ocean waters, the uh, ocean is able to draw down additional CO2. However, if the alkalinity is not sufficiently dispersed, then the uh, then the ocean there will not be the reactions needed to actually suck down CO2. So all of these different technologies have these different risks of MMRV, and because the industries are so fragmented and there's no not yet a unified standard behind this, there's uh, there's there can't be the confidence that's needed for these technologies to scale and re reach a climate impactful scale. So there could be there. Must be maybe a third party who can certify that removals are happening at the scales that are necessary. There could be a self governance method where Ed Carbon Planetary, this is an example with ocean alkalinity enhancement, where the industry groups are convening by pathways in order to set those standards. What technologies are being used? What sensors are being used? Where should the sensors be placed so that there is some standardization across uh, different technology providers? There is a risk, though. Many of these companies. Uh, from conversations that we've been having, these companies, their MMRV is their is basically their IP and their whole com competitive business model. So there are some risks that actually these folks might not want to convene and share that information. So they might align on an MMRV pathway uh, on standards by a pathway, and then those standards can then be implemented and forced within a, a certain pathway. Another model could be governmental influence. We might have the likes of the Fossil Energy and Carbon Management or NOAA or some other regulatory body in the United States or internationally appointing a group or an individual of, uh, uh, or groups of individuals as MMRV experts. You know, we have those, those 50 plus reviewers on Frontier. Why could they not be appointed by the US government to sign off on uh, different projects? Those experts could propose and validate MMRV methodologies on a project by project basis, making sure that, you know, when planetary is adding alkalinity to the ocean, that we have some experts who are signing off on what's actually going on. And then finally, those standards can be set, implemented, and enforced. I think having these conversations, we are more of the opinion that governmental influence could be the way forward because, you know, 
when we have uh, when we have self governance by the uh, by the likes of a by the oceanography enhancement industry, who is going to actually be overseeing it? There could be misaligned incentives and create scenarios where the best in class MMRV protocols are not actually being followed, and thus that's where the government can come in and help to create a standard player field across the industry. And with that, I can pass it off to Corey to talk us through nature-based solutions. Great, thanks, Cam. Yeah, so uh, Cam covered a lot of great points. Um, and what I'm gonna cover uh, is gonna largely reiterate his points, but also uh, shed some new insights uh, using uh, another example, which is nature-based solutions. And so um, starting off with the point here that uh, nature-based solutions have really been um, at the heart of, of criticism around carbon markets. Um, if you think about all of the classic um, uh, criticisms, uh, nature-based uh, has been a, a, a key example. Um, and we wanted to highlight that here uh, to just to show, um, to show what's, what's the current state, what's not working, and then uh, where do we go from here and how ELM can, can kind of provide that path. Um, and so when we talk about nature-based, there are some, uh, a lot of the avoidance-based activities come to mind, right? We're talking about avoided deforestation, we're talking about uh, no or low, low tilling in, in ag, we're talking about uh, manure uh, management, fertilizer management in ag, uh, methane mitigation, et cetera. Um, but as uh, we've discussed at length here already is um, uh, these avoidance activities under ELM um, are covered in, in terms of liabilities management and uh, companies having incentives to reduce their uh, carbon footprint within their own supply chains. Um, and I think it's really uh, critical here to, I guess, debunk some of the myths and concerns um, and, and, and key words that have been kind of thrown around in today's state of, of carbon markets. And, um, you know, just to pick on two of them, uh, permanence and additionality are two that really come up all the time um, when it comes to nature-based solutions. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure this 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 audience is is well versed and familiar with the terms. Um, but just simply put, um, you know, there there are these you know carbon carbon principles, and in order to generate uh, credits, uh, permanence and additionality, um, you know, are are, are key principles. Um, but it's, it's no secret that these terms, these principles have been around since the beginning of carbon markets. And um, just by the fact that we're having this, this, this presentation today um, in the current state of things, they're just not working. Um, and they have really just plagued um, the, de the development and scaling of carbon markets since the days of the clean development mechanism. Um, and so thankfully, um, under uh, this concept of, of ELM, these concerns really do kind of fall away. And so if we move on to the next slide here, as we start thinking about going into that, 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 that ELM, ELM state of the world, the, the focus must be on, on removals, right? And, and within Nature Base, there are a number of um, current and developing practices um, that do uh, have potential to sequester carbon. Um, you know, in ag, those are practices like cover cropping, agroforestry, um, and then there are also some. There's also some overlap with some of the technologies that um, Cam mentioned um, in terms of enhanced weathering, and then and, and then also uh, biochar, which is um, uh, basically uh, uh, a material that's created through the, uh, the process of pyrolysis uh, of biomass and and it traps uh, organic matter into a, a pretty stable carbon-rich material, and so. Um, uh, a lot of different kind of developing and current tech, uh, 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 approaches, um, uh, but the the underlying uh, point here is that just as in in tech based solutions, uh, nature based solutions that are focused on removals uh, must rely on reliable MMRV uh, to scale. Uh, so if we move on to the next page, um, we we highlight some of the key MMRV challenges, um, you know, current states. Um, across kind of three major buckets, climate smart ag, reforestation or regeneration, and then kind of the, the biochar enhanced weathering um, uh, space. I want to be mindful of time. I, there, there are, you know, don't want to kind of read off the slide, but uh, the, the high level here is that MMRV is, is certainly improving, um, you know, but it's a still, still a work in progress. Um, you know, I see David Hayes in, in the audience um, and, you know, he and, and um, you know, a group of, of uh, 
Stanford graduates also, uh, you know, published a, 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 an article recently um, about kind of the, the key MMRV challenges um, in, you know, the field of climate smart ag, you know, they're working on, on forestry this quarter, um, it's a great paper, would recommend. Um, and um, it focuses on kind of what is needed from kind of a government level kind of data management perspective, um, both in terms of funding, leveraging kind of the recent, you know, IRA um, and climate smart commodities uh, program initiatives um, to help kind of uh, remove this bottleneck uh, in the system. Um, and so it's, it's very aligned to Cam's point about uh, needing a, a higher level um, kind of standard in order to uh, bring a little bit more order to the heterogeneity that we see um, uh, in the space. Um, and then moving on to, to the last slide here, um, to be intellectually honest, we also wanted to highlight a couple of open questions um, that we still have in, in nature-based solutions. Um, one being kind of the tree problem is what we've been kind of uh, calling it in our, in our practicum, uh, which is, you know, the, the, the issue of deforestation, right, where um, while most avoidance activities will be uh, internalized into company supply chain, um, deforestation and forestry um, are kind of left questionable uh, in terms of whose supply chain will cover will cover that that very important activity. And the second question is around ownership, where um, there's a question mark around the ability to separate carbon assets from their natural capital basis um, and how that imposes upon property rights um, and also international uh, borders. Um, you know, we could potentially draw from lessons uh, from, from water markets, um, you know, Australia deregulating um, and separating uh, water from, from land in the 90s. In the U.S., it's a little bit more uh, complex across, you know, Western versus Eastern states. Um, but there's the question of like, hey, um, you know, this carbon sits in, in, in natural capital bases um, and, and that raises certain property rights and, and legal questions um, with them. So I'm going to pause there. I think we're, we're right on time. Good time. Um, yeah. And we'll, we'll move on. Great. Thank you, Cam, Bennett, and Corey. Nice work. Thanks, everyone. All right, uh, Abigail. I am here to talk about the scientific measurement of carbon. Um, I am the sole engineer in this class and I'm really interested in the idea of uncertainty in my own research, uh, which is not carbon market related, um, but I really wanted to focus on that today. Um, and just to kind of scope the project that I've been working on so far is I thought, because about one third of mar uh, carbon credits issued in the voluntary carbon market um, are in frustration. Um, and therefore I thought it would be important to focus on measuring uh, forest carbon, uh, specifically measuring um, above ground biomass. Um, so above ground biomass is um, in the carbon pool of every uh, kind of large carbon standards, uh, whereas soil carbon wood products um, below ground biomass is not included in um, the quote unquote carbon pool of uh, the large carbon uh, standards. So I wanted to focus on a generalizable problem that has its own pros and cons. Um, but perhaps this could be um, inferred and scaled based on that. Um, above ground biomass, we're referring to anything essentially above the soil. Um, and roughly uh, the carbon content of above ground biomass is about half. So let's say uh, the biomass of this beautiful tree on the screen is 100. Uh, the carbon uh, content would be 50 um, of whatever units uh, we are using. Um, and the above ground biomass varies significantly by forest type and by region. Uh, in a boreal forest, there perhaps is 64 tons of metric tons of carbon uh, per hectare, where in croplands, it's only two. So we can't say in remote sensing that this square hectare of land uh, holds a hundred uh, 
tons of carbon um, as that is varying by region, by species, by forest type. Um, and again, this is particularly important with these uh, red um, plus uh, projects and other um, avoided emissions and uh, preventing deforestation in uh, carbon markets and carbon credits. So my main question of interest is how can we reduce uncertainty in the measurement of above uh, ground biomass? Um, and we're really looking at uncertainty with one, the accuracy of the measurement itself, two, the choice of the allometric model, which is essentially converting the measurement to a volume to biomass, uh, three, the sampling certain, um, uncertainty related to plot sizes we choose to sample, and for the uncertainty and statistical representation of scaling um, our uh, measurements, uh, we can only sample so many plots. Um, therefore, how do we choose those plots to sample? So our four major sources of uncertainty. More or less, if we wanted to accurately measure carbon uh, approaching 0% error, we would have to cut down um, all the trees um, dry them and weigh them. And that would give us an accurate estimate of uh, carbon in, uh, in a forest. So this is time consuming, impractical, labor intensive, and not scalable. Um, perhaps we could do this for some trees and not others, but then we're estimating the amount of uh, above ground biomass. Um, and it, that ruins the accuracy gains that this destructive sampling method uh, provides us. So as a solution uh, from the mid 60s through the early 2000s, field measurement was really popular. Field measurement is essentially just going to the forest and measuring the trees. We're measuring the height, the diameter, and the crown area. Um, this is giving us an uncertainty between 15 and 30% of our accuracy of how much carbon we know is actually in each uh, plot of each forest plot. So the accuracy comes in two parts largely. One, uh, the measurement itself. Um, any measurement we take, um, as we know, is going to have some uncertainty. Is it is the ruler being held right? Is the wind blowing one way, et cetera? And then the larger source of uncertainty is the allometric model. That is the regression model that we use the height, the diameter, and the wood density to compute the carbon. Um, and that very varies through uh, region um, and data, uh, specifically data on wood density, so species specific. And this is providing high levels of uncertainty, but accepted um, through the literature process that I've um, and literature review that I conducted of perhaps uh, 60 different uh, studies. Um, and accuracy or uh, root mean square error of around 20% was okay, um, being that that is for practicality logistics. So carbon actors uh, in the market right now, we're operating with around 15 to 30% accuracy of what their stock was. There are a few different uh, remote sensing technologies, of course. I am going to focus on LIDAR. Um, so LIDAR is a measurement uh, via laser pulse um, to kind of visualize the volume of a space. Um, and this is used beyond uh, a grove above ground biomass measurement, particularly in my field, we use it in building energy a lot, but um, it's been very popular in the past uh, 10, 15 years um, in measuring biomass. There is the misconception, and particularly at a small scale, this is inexpensive. I have a later slide on this, uh, but recent studies have shown us that this is actually perhaps four times cheaper than the field measurement method when you're uh, thinking of labor costs um, and time. Um, and this is possible to give us 90% accuracy, so only 10% error at the one hectare scale um, and 95% at the half acre scale uh, from a few studies done in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, particularly lighter is really um, high accuracy in temperate forests and boreal forests and tropical forests. Um, some uh, 
croplands, shrublands, et cetera, with uh, lower density and uh, lower heights, this accuracy is not being reached. Um, and solutions have been being worked on there, pairing this with other satellite imagery and, and machine learning models to get that accuracy up there. But in those other scenarios, accuracy is perhaps only down um, in the 60 or 70% ranges. Abigail, um, we're about two minutes. Great. So um, more or less with the owl metric models, that is the highest source of uncertainty for um, our LIDAR measurements. Um, a literature review of 402 uh, above ground biomass studies uh, found that allometric equations to convert volume from LIDAR to carbon uh, exists for some, but not all forests, as I was saying, and also does not exist for many countries. Many regions with high forestation do not have these models built. Therefore, um, we cannot accurately represent uh, these in time. So what approach should carbon mark take? Um, one, uh, LIDAR is cost effective uh, at a large scale and national scale. It could cost only one cent per hectare. Uh, so building this um, and scaling this and focusing on the allometric models to more accurately convert our very accurate LIDAR measurements to very accurate carbon measurements is necessary. Um, so what's next? It's building trust. Uh, trans parent supply chains of what uncertainty is in uh, the purchase of a hectare of forest um, and legislators need verification methods. Um, developing standards, standardization of these allometric equations so um, and sampling techniques to minimize bias and to increase precision. Um, and finally, sharing knowledge, open data repositories. So if these allometric equations already, equations already exist, they are shared. Um, and uh, folks using LIDAR can scale their solutions. Um, I see a future of measuring forest and above ground biomass at the one hectare airborne LIDAR scale with species specific allometric models uh, can build trust um, across actors in the carbon market, can be harmonized um, and standardized to be cost effective and accurate. Thank you so much, Abigail, that was great. And some groups I'm able to chat the time warning and some I'm gonna give it uh, verbally. So. Uh, since you guys are on the same screen, Claudio and Nora, you're going to get the two-minute warning audio style. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Abigail. That was terrific. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, hello, everyone. We are presenting uh, our project on scaling coal phase out with carbon market financing. Uh, I am Claudio Guardado. My name is Nora. So we will be talking about uh, just like the problem we have in front of us in terms of uh, coal assets, um, the business case that is behind uh, these assets and, and, and how to phase them out. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of case studies. Uh, we have uh, one from Chile and one potentially from Indonesia. Uh, we will talk about uh, how the a BCM model uh, will work uh, with coal phase out and how ELM also uh, can help boost uh, the coal phase out. So starting on uh, the context, uh, it is crucial to phase out coal assets just because this is the main source of CO2 emissions from the energy industry. So it's a critical component of the energy transition. Uh, in order to achieve the Paris Agreement goal, uh, we will need to retire one coal unit per day or 100 gigawatts uh, per year until 2040. Uh, there are several challenges uh, in order to get there. There's a lack uh, of uh, fiscal uh, incentives, uh, political will, and also we have a booming energy demand in, in different regions, especially in developing countries. Uh, so we can see on the right uh, side of the slide uh, how uh, the coal electricity generation has just increased. And and the challenge we have in front of us is, is huge, especially uh, thinking about the developing common economies growing in coal energy consumption. So here we have uh, the NG Chile case study. Uh, basically, the methodology they followed was uh, raising money from investors, uh, especially the IDB investment 
a fund uh, with a 125 million loan package. Uh, NG managed to invest this money in a wind farm in Calama that uh, operates 150 megawatts uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, this will enable the phase out of two uh, coal plants they had in the Tocopilla region. So uh, this is a way they were connecting not only uh, phasing out coal assets, but also uh, wind farms. And at the end, the mechanism they were using was monetizing uh, the avoided emissions uh, through our reduction in the interest rate of 15 million uh, of the loan that IDB invested. Uh, the baseline they were using uh, uh, is mainly that gap between producing energy with coal and with uh, uh, wind. And uh, so far right now they have already deployed the wind farm. They have retired a couple of coal assets in 2022, uh, a total of 5.16 million tons uh, of CO2 are expected to be uh, displaced, uh, but uh, uh, the efficacy of, of this method has yet to be determined. Uh, another case that we analyzed was uh, the uh, energy transition mechanism that is happening in Indonesia. Basically, the main difference with uh, the previous case is that the asset ownership here will uh, uh, will change. Uh, and it will uh, the investor will will become the owner of the asset, uh, whereas in the NG case, NG uh, was still the the, the owner. Uh, the MOU was signed to pilot this in Indonesia, and this is just a, a, a similar effort happening in a different part of the world. So at the end, the problem statement we have in front of us is uh, uh, understanding if uh, carbon finance can help scale coal phase out and renewables in developing countries. I'll pass uh, it to Nuri. So to answer that question, then we explore two options and to see whether it could work out. Uh, so number one, option number one is, let's see if we can do carbon phase out under voluntary carbon markets. Uh, if that's the case, then how would it actually look like? So in front of you, we have um, like a transition structure on how carbon markets can be, can be plugged in into the whole financing mechanism that is uh, being done at the moment in terms of um, retiring coal early. So you'll see on the gray boxes, it's pretty much similar to NG case, or oh, the ETM uh, ADB case uh, in Indonesia. So you have new investors coming over and taking over the, the cool asset and try to retire it early. Now the question is how can carbon markets come into play? And here we can see um, the money can come from the carbon markets through prepaid forward contracts, wherein um, the initial the, the funding um, can be raised early on before the coal plants being retired. And once um, the carbon is being avoided uh, as time, time passed by, then this uh, about the emissions will be delivered to, to the owner of the, the forward contract. So that I would imagine how hypothetically how would that um, kind of car market being uh, plugged in into the, the transition mechanism here. Um, so what are the issues with this kind of approach? So on the next slide we have um, the typical you know issues that have been plugging BCM all this while and we just uh, further uh, look uh, in depth. Um, in here, we have three issues that we thought of can be solvable, can, can be solved um, if we have uh, initiatives in place. So, for example, leakages, uh, the issue is about um, having, when, well, when you shut down existing coal plant, new ones will crop up. And then how we can we combat that is by getting the host country's commitments or by, or by getting commitment from the existing, buyer, uh, existing investors that we have bought them out to no longer invest in new coal plants. So in, 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 in that way, then you sort of plug the leakage. Uh, another way is also you can replace that with renewable plants. So any gaps that have been left out by uh, retired coal plants will be filled up with renewables. Second on the permanence issue, again, uh, I think this 
uh, pretty much straightforward. You can see the coal plant being phased out, so no, no more emissions coming from that uh, plant. On the MRV side, is in terms of how do you estimate uh, amount of emissions coming from, from the plant. I think this can also be solved uh, by having a specialized MRV focusing on, you know, what type of uh, coal or what type of uh, coal plant, is it subcritical, supercritical, and sort of measure uh, amount of emission that can be avoided um, from, from this plant. Um, the next, however, the next issue is not easy, not easily addressable. So the next issue is about additionality. So additionality is about would this transition have happened if? So when we let, when we try to look at um, when we try to answer this question in regards to uh, coal plant and in Indonesia, it, it's really tough to answer this question, and this could be the reason why it will not work out under the BCM. So number one is, would this transition have happened if the owners change? And our argument is that yes, it can happen if the new owner is very intentional and they can run the coal plants economically uh, better than the previous owner. So it can be done in a way, for example, the PPA can be renegotiated or the new owner is much more efficient at running the plant, for example. And, and when those conditions are satisfied, then there's no need for having some markets to come in and there's no additionality element here. So that's the first problem with regards to uh, VCM. The second problem with regards to VCM is um, coal subsidies. So again, the question that we ask ourselves, would this transaction have happened if uh, or under the policy regime in the energy sector? So in Indonesia at the moment, um, Indonesia is actually the second largest coal exporter and sixth largest coal reserves. And they have a regulation that really um, restrict the coal mines such that they are required to sell to domestic energy sector uh, minimum amount at a very highly subsidized uh, price. Um, so at $70 per ton. And we know the average price of coal is about 200 to 300 tons. So definitely by having this, what we call as administered price, then, then running coal plant in, in Indonesia is very economical rather than running a renewable energy. So in some ways, you're creating this artificially depressed price for coal that allows this plant to continue um, operating. Now, the question is, if we remove that, then, then would coal plant naturally be phased out? And the answer is definitely yes, because, because, because of the price of the coal. Again, this raised that additionality questions of um, the value add of, of, of VCM in this case. Uh, the third question I ask ourselves is, would this transaction have happened if carbon saving, savings were not commercialized? Um, again, in this case, we looked at Indonesia, like uh, they have they have net, not z net zero pledges, they have regulation in place. They sort of imply that even without carbon markets, that this industry will need to be phased out anyway. Um, so with this in mind, then is there a need for BCM to come in? Because what is, what, then the question is, what is the additional value add of BCM? If there's, a, if there's a regulation anyway coming in place. So it's all about an enforcement issue. Um, so again, this sort of perspective raises the question, um, is, there, is there a role for VCM uh, for co -face out? Um, so we've seen the issues and we the, we've, we tried to look at the second option on co -face out under ELM and see whether there is, a, whether there is an answer there. And Unfortunately, no. <laughs> um, so we looked at emission liability accounting, we looked at offset accounting, and given that coal phase out is naturally a carbon avoidance project, it cannot fit under the ELM framework because the ELM doesn't speculate on potential emissions avoided. There are many issues around this, um, for example, double counting. When the coal on when the new coal owners reduce their emissions, then um, would the credit purchaser also enjoy the same benefits of that reduction? So there's the double counting element there. So there's also a moral hazard in terms of um, calculating the baseline of emissions. Will there be uh, will will it will it be susceptible to manipulation or gaming such that the whole country can can read that so that they can they can they can maximize the amount of offsets that they can issue when they retire the coal earlier, and of course the additionality problem that uh, I have described uh, earlier as well. <laughs> that the question arises then: what are what are alternatives available under the UN? Perfect. You got two minutes to give us the alternatives. 
Perfect. Just to wrap up, uh, we have been discussing uh, three alternatives. One is the global carbon permits uh, to enable money flow from rich countries to developing countries uh, through a, a global budget of CO2 emissions. Uh, then the second option is uh, having a non-offset incentives by creating a fund uh, that could generate reputational PR and satisfaction for uh, end customers of, of companies. And in this way, we could uh, fund these kind of projects. And the third option is similar to the first one, but this is a country's compliance carbon market to enable uh, an emission allowance system within a specific country. So uh, our conclusion is uh, it is needed to do the coal phase out and replace it with renewables in developing countries in order to achieve uh, the net zero goals. Uh, the problem is that uh, carbon credits generated cannot be traded uh, primarily as offset because of the additionality and the other issues that we just discussed. And uh, at the end, uh, we consider that the three solutions that we just shared on global carbon permits, uh, regional concessional funds, and uh, a national uh, carbon market could enable this transition. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Claudio and Nora. Well done and right on time. We're in the home stretch here. We got two more. Uh, that was the coal problem, and we found some alternatives. Thank you. Uh, and now we're going to deal with the tree problem, and that's uh, Haley. Let's talk about the tree problem, because we've all heard how tricky avoided deforestation credits are, how low quality, highly suspect avoided deforestation credits are. So I'm going to dive right into this tricky problem and talk about the a case study within Ghana and the RED program, which aims to avoid deforestation in Ghana. The purpose of this presentation we is see to... your we see your desktop, not your oh, no. That's not what you want to see. I um, mean it's nice, it's a pretty picture, but that's actually not my desktop. I sorry, I am trying to oh that's your okay. Yeah, oh, it's so funny. Okay. The one time I didn't ask, can you guys see my screen? You guys <laughs> couldn't see my screen. <laughs> well, now you know, people will tell you. Yeah. Okay, now perfect. you're able to be able to share now. Yes, now we see it. Okay, perfect. So the purpose of this presentation is twofold. Uh, one, to characterize the Ghanaian Red Plus program and second, to compare how this would look a little bit different under ELM. So starting with some background and deforestation in Ghana, I'm going to breeze through some of the background just because I'm a little worried about running over on time. But suffice to say, deforestation in Ghana is a significant problem. Ghana has lost more than 60% of forest cover since 1950, and this has only increased in recent years. The current deforestation rate is 3.2%, which equates to 20 or 35 million tons of carbon emissions each year. You can see in one of the recent studies there showing the deforestation of one section um, of Ghana from 1990 to 2015, significant amounts of forest loss. And this is primarily driven by agriculture. So uh, cacao farming to produce cocoa accounts for 13% of the loss of Ghana's forests. And this is primarily due to expansion of cropland. So as cacao forests, the land has been used over many years, it's no longer fertile. Farmers will expand into fertile forest land, slash and burn, and expand their cropland in that way. There's other drivers of deforestation, logging, mining, and wildfires, and overall just uh, a lack of enforcement that's leading to this significant amount of forest loss. So looking a little bit at the red plus program. The idea is to provide results-based payment and financial support to stop deforestation and avoid the further emissions from deforestation. So looking a little bit about how the program is structured, the sources break down into the majority of sources of the fund coming from private sector investment. So this is a lot of the big chocolate players who are in the area who are already investing in the space and directing that towards more climate smart agricultural practices. And then the carbon fund, that's where you see red credit sales, um, carbon offset credits coming in um, and funneling through the carbon fund to pay for this program as well. And then there's also a mix of government funding and grants. 
what is the funding used for? So the largest component of this is the subtitle referred to as increasing yields via climate smart cocoa. And this is actually through farmer engagement practices. So as farmers are transitioning over to using more climate friendly agricultural practices, they're being compensated for that and then also have access to credit and yield insurances uh, to support as they're making the transition to using fertilizers um, as opposed to expanding into new land. Another way that they can do more uh, climate smart agriculture is through shade grown cacao. So that's actually growing cacao under shaded forest lands as opposed to slashing and burning. And it's actually shown to have higher yields in the long run. But unfortunately in the short run, there are uh, better yields from direct sunlight grown cacao. And so there's a bit of misaligned incentives there and the uh, financing is supposed to help bridge that gap to moving to this more climate smart agricultural practices. There's also funding for MRV, which is a key part of the uh, results-based payment piece of this transaction. And so if we look through what the actual transaction looks like, it started with collecting data early um, 2010s to be able to create a baseline for what emissions looked like in this specific region of Ghana um, from 2005 to 2014. They essentially, through a variety of field measurements, satellite imaging, um, other estimates, using a lot of research uh, to come up with what is the baseline for the number of emissions on average within that period. And so that's what they're using essentially as their counterfactual to be able to compare and contrast that with what is being done after these red incentives are implemented. So after a period of time, they started in 2019, measuring over a six month period of time, what are the current emissions after the red program has been implemented? And then they calculate the difference between what the baseline is, what the current emissions are estimated to be, and use that to determine the amount of emissions that have been reduced through the program. At that point, they then take two discounts. So one being an uncertainty discount, which is uncertainty in the measurement itself and how effective they are at actually measuring the amount of emissions that have been reduced. And then the second is in a reversal potential, which is uh, knowing that in the future, this uh, this could be reversed and the lands could end up being deforested. So they have um, some justification for why they chose both of those numbers to discount the uh, emission reductions. So those are then sold at $5 per ton of carbon that is uh, not emitted, so the avoided emissions, and those are transferred to a trustee. So at that point, there's then two tranches, one of which goes to the trustee and can be used for their own carbon accounting and emissions reductions, and actually a vast majority that is retransferred re back to Ghana to be able to use um, in their own carbon accounting and uh, national determined contributions for reducing emissions. So as we've all heard, there are some questions of the legitimacy of these types of carbon offset credits, given that they're for avoiding deforestation. The first being additionality. A couple of things here. One, we don't have the counterfactual for the future. We're basing it on historical projections. If we um, notice that the actual transition to climate smart cacao would actually be profitable, it's hard to know whether or not this transition would occur with or without the RED program. Leakage and permanence as well, there are, there's a lot of research out there, uh, mostly coming from Brazil, showing that the, you know, when payments end, that the uh, deforestation recurs again, or that if the actual demand for these commodities isn't decreased, then it leaks into deforestation in other areas. So in the case of Ghana, that could be the Ivory Coast, for example, um, where if, um, or even other regions that are not being tracked under this program, that would end up being deforested. So some concerns on additionality, leakage, permanence, and measurement that we've all heard about. What would this look like then under ELM? And as we've noted, the trees don't necessarily fit perfectly under the ELM framework. Um, but if we were just to imagine that tomorrow ELM is implemented, what would happen is that all standing forests would be capitalized as carbon stocks and nations would be required to maintain those carbon stocks. So if they were to slash and burn uh, a forest, the resultant uh, degradation of their carbon stocks would need to be replaced with some form of carbon removals. As has been mentioned many times before, e-liabilities can only be balanced by carbon removals. 
not by offsets. And so under this framework, you could think that maybe this would end all sort of payments and financing for avoided deforestation, because the idea is that preventing the release of carbon into the atmosphere shouldn't give permission for someone else to emit. And if you're wondering why there's a cookie emoji on there, that's because this is the, the cookie jar is my way of wrapping my head around this problem. If you think of carbon stocks as a cookie jar that you always want to keep full, me preventing my sister from taking a cookie out of the jar shouldn't give me permission to then take a cookie out of the jar. I have to be able to replace that cookie um, through what would be a carbon removal for that to be effective. So oh, this idea- One minute, just- F Oh yeah, okay. So <laughs> the idea is that um, you can't use avoided deforestation in order to be able to give yourself license to emit. But a potential solution to this as a benefit of trees is that they're carbon stocks, but they are also a source of carbon removals. And so if you allow a forest to grow and continue to photosynthesize, you then have additional carbon removal and carbon that is being stored, and that can become saleable. So if we flip this problem on its head and say, we're not going to think about this in terms of avoided deforestation, but instead we think about if we leave the standing forest, that continues to grow and remove carbon, that can actually be saleable carbon removals, which could then be, make them even more value for the standing forests and um, lead to avoided deforestation. So wrapping up really quickly here, um, the idea is that if you can then leave the standing forest, sell those carbon removals, um, there's a lot of benefit here with the time value of carbon. Standing forests can remove a lot more carbon than planting trees that will eventually remove carbon in the future. Um, ELAM eliminates all the concerns of permanence, additionality, and leakage. Some of the main questions are, you know, driving up the, the price of these nature-based removals and whether or not the market will tolerate the necessary increase to be able to uh, overcome that opportunity cost of growing cacao and eventually, or in, and ultimately removing the trees. But I will end there because I think I'm over on time. So thank you. That was great. Thank you, Haley. So we've got some solutions to the coal problem. We've got some solutions to the tree problem. And now we're going to look at our last group is going to look at the capacity of current markets on supply and some legal frameworks. And then Tom's going to wrap it all up. Yeah, so I'll kick us off. So our project looked at the state of current markets um, from a study of both carbon offsets and in terms of proposing a legal framework for ELM. So we'll actually start off from a really similar perspective as some of the other teams, which is in avoided offsets. Um, so we'll first talk about the current undersupply of ELM valid carbon assets. Uh, second, the legal framework for carbon offsets under ELM, and then wrap up with some recommendations for governments, businesses, and individuals. So I'll kick us off with the talking about the current undersupply of ELM valid carbon assets. And the takeaway here is just that current voluntary carbon markets are reliant heavily on avoidance offsets. So if we look at this year by year breakdown of each of the carbon offset types, starting from 2010 and going to 2021, we see that what would commonly be termed avoidance offsets make up a vast majority of the offsets that are currently on the market. And the thing is that avoidance offsets don't exist under ELM. Um, but many of the supply chain incentives will remain without the faulty accounting. Now, let's break that down. So in the status quo of voluntary carbon markets, uh, avoidance emissions can create avoidance offsets that can be used. We just heard a really great analogy of the cookies. If we prevent someone from taking a cookie, we suddenly, in the status quo, have authority to take a cookie. And so this means that companies are incentivized to collect credit for avoidance offsets, um, but overcounting and faulty baseline projections, which have also been talked about, plague accounting and offsetting schemes that currently exist. Now, under emissions liability management, avoided emissions reduce the emissions that a company is held liable for offsetting, but doesn't actually offset any emissions that they do release into the atmosphere. Now, the kicker is that most current avoidance offset activities are still incentivized. So the activities that avoidance offsets are counting for in the status quo don't just go away, um, but they're just still incentivized by ELM to lower emissions earlier in supply chains, and only direct actors are held liable here. Now, if we go back to the chart that we were seeing on the previous slide, we see that the 
dark yellow bit is the tech-based carbon capture, which is really the gold standard of offsets that we want to be shooting for in an ELM scheme. And the part that goes away is the nature-based avoidance, which has uh, an entirely entire presentation dedicated to it. Um, and all of these yellow boxes are things that are currently could count as avoidance offsets um, and are activities that would still be incentivized under the ELM scheme, just not by actually accounting as an offset. And so the counting shifts, but the incentives remain. And that's the key part here. Now, another good part of ELM is that it's really creating fresh demand for removal offsets, which is the gold standard tech-based offset that I was highlighting in the previous slide. Um, and this incentivizes a growth of the removal offset supply. So again, looking at the status quo, which recognizes both avoidance and removal offsets, we see that this contrasts with the ELM case because ELM will only recognize offsets that directly affect the carbon balance of the atmosphere. And as we discussed, avoidance offsets don't do that. Now in the status quo, avoidance offsets dominate. And that's because they're cheaper and current carbon accounting schemes don't really take permanence of offsets into account where a ton is just this ton. But under an ELM scheme, removal offsets are going to be experiencing a sharp growth because essentially they're longer lasting and companies have to account for every ton of emissions liability. So essentially every year that the carbon remains in the air. And so we see that we are not only remo removing the disambiguity of um, avoidance versus removal offsets, but also creating fresh incentive for tech-based removals here. Now, the last kicker is that we really do need more removal offsets to meet the demand of corporations if they were to commit to ELM tomorrow. So in the status quo market, there simply isn't enough removal offset supply to, to meet the demand for companies should they attempt to meet their true emissions liabilities. And right now, offsets and net zero commitments are also suffering from poor differentiation, where one net zero commitment is much the same as another. And um, so the next steps here is first to better differentiate net zero commitments by emissions liabilities. And essentially all this means is we want to make sure that we're differentiating between companies that are accounting for their emissions by truly depending on tech-based removal offsets, as opposed to a uh, nature-based removal, for example, that might go away in five years. That's okay, but we need to make sure that that removal is continuing to be held liable for the company. Um, so that's the really big part for ELM. The second part is to use ELM accounting um, to only consider activities that are directly balancing the atmospheric carbon balance. And finally, to increase the demand for and money available for developing removal offset technologies. And here I'll pass it off to Callie. Thank you. I also want to take a moment to appreciate your background. I like the the forest. I think it's a good, <laughs> good theme. Um, Okay, hello everybody. Um, the resident lawyer squad, me and Drew kicking off. Um, we did a little bit more um, kind of information gathering about the, the relevant legal issues in the carbon offset uh, market uh, in terms of ELM. I think most of the framework that we are, I'll discuss briefly is stuff that's well established. And I wouldn't say Drew and I are like ideating new legal challenges, but here's a little bit of a um, overview. So the current legal framework is complicated and fragmented, um, as is very par for the course in international law. There's no real standard international agreement that holds weight. Um, and there are a bunch of different national, regional, local schemes um, that regulate the trade. Uh, this then makes it complicated not only for governments and enforcement mechanisms, but also companies to trade removal assets across borders, assess the quality, and invest in removal projects um, due to uncertainties described below. Next slide, Lana. Um, so when we are looking at the potential uh, updates for this system, uh, a couple of the important uh, principles that we have kind of come across are transparency, quality assurance, and legal certainty. Um, yes. Next slide. <laughs> okay, so it is in, in a lot of the literature, there are kind of three options for the legal status offsets um, that have kind of been discussed uh, extensively, one being removal offsets as intangible property. Um, and then here's some US code that, that would kind of fall under. And then obviously that would then have to be translated into different jurisdictions. Um, the sec section, second option would be offsets as a bundle of contractual rights. And then the third would be removal projects being distinct from transactions of removal offsets. Next slide, Lana. 
Um, important properties when we are considering these different legal frameworks uh, and deciding between them uh, would be fungibility, uh, security of transfer, and standardized documentation. Um, so these there's much more to go into in each of these um, categories and, and different frameworks that can enforce one of these uh, principles over another. Um, but there is just this idea of it being effective, it being a sure thing, and then it having some sort of kind of standardization across the board. Um, that would seem to be simple, but it, it um, maybe it seems more complicated, but it's just something that's not been achieved um, in any of the current uh, structures. Next slide, Lina. Um, okay, so then here's some just broader ideas for updating the legal framework, um, creating a uniform public disclosure regime uh, that would give buyers and suppliers a, um, a transparent network uh, and information disclosure uh, opportunity, um, developing a standard for accounting methods, setting higher requirements for capitalization of buffer pools, um, for instances where your, the offsets might be um, disrupted or their questions of liability are, are brought up. Um, more frequent enforcement actions against um, individual projects and uh, companies who are knowingly or perhaps not knowingly violating the uh, market laws and, and uh, perhaps uh, perpetrating fraud. And then allowing certification of only high quality offsets. Um, and that is, something that is also hard because it's those are again those are disrupted by time or whatever but at least having some sort of baseline that's uniform and standardized across the uh different registers would be great next slide i think now i'm handing it off to drew all right thanks callie um it's good to be part of the aspiring uh legal like lawyer squad um just to be clear yeah so i'll run through some here we go some more legal proposals um we need a clear definition of minimum standards uh, to ensure, like these are broadly tradable to ensure there's liquidity. Um, we also recommend uh, locating registers and jurisdictions that have that clarity and in jurisdictions where there isn't that clarity, but that might be important. Um, we recommend legislative amendments. Uh, next slide, Lemma. Yeah, we also need um, a grievance dispute mechanism, basically something that works, um, that's reliable, um, so businesses can, yeah, can have predictability, um, which is essential for them to invest in this space. Uh, slide, please. Yeah, and I'll go through a few sort of general sets of recommendations for governments, businesses, and individuals. Slide. For governments, yeah, governments have the huge role here for trying to create um, a liability that we're going to basically be taking what we now have um, as shareholder value and um, reduce that, governments are going to need to be the ones to make that happen. Um, so yeah, the first point and the last point on this slide um, are really essential. The, yeah, governments have to cooperate with each other um, to make this happen. It's going to be tough, um, particularly with international cooperation and the idea that uh, there can be sort of defectors or, or free riders, right? Countries that have weaker regulatory regimes um, and companies can engage in regulatory arbitrage. Um, so we think that a, an environment or a global uh, type of international solution would be uh, important here. Slide please. Yeah, so for businesses, um, what they can do is participate actively in removal projects. They can promote transparency by themselves being transparent um, in disclosing their liabilities and their removal actions and pressuring other businesses to do the same. Um, they can stimulate demand for removal offsets by committing to their uh, net zero emissions targets, which they've many of them have done already. And they can contribute to the development of removal offset standards um, by collaborating with governments, NGOs, and other stakeholders to create robust, transparent, and reliable standards. A little bit on this point, um, we recognize that this is going to benefit companies that are already established, like any sort of existing regulation, they're going to be incentivized to have regulations that they can follow and that smaller businesses might not be able to follow. So that's something we will, as policy makers, want to keep in mind. Slide, please. Yeah, and for individuals, um, individual action is important here. 
uh, people can purchase removal option offsets, excuse me, on their own to neutralize emissions. They can create pressure to incentivize corporations to offset their emissions, their emissions through their spending, and they can create pressure through uh, contact with policymakers, like call your senator, call your congressman, et cetera, to sort of uh, get the ball rolling in this direction. Um, yeah, and finally, climate education initiatives uh, we think are important to, to sort of, uh, yeah, to increase public understanding and move the ball forward in this area. Slide. Okay, that's a call to action. I sort of went through already. Um, slide. Okay, and this is what we spoke about. We have, I think, a little time for questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lina, Callie, and Drew. We, you do have five more minutes, and there are two questions that have popped up. Do you guys want to start on answering those? And then I'm going to turn it over to Mark and Tom for at, at quarter till for the wrap-up. Yes, I'd love to. Uh, I think the first question that I saw from the chat was on creating a computational connectivity between avoidance and removal. Nick, do you think you could expand on that question a little? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, markets need to price efficiently uh, avoidance today and removal tomorrow or removal today, avoidance tomorrow. Uh, under ELM or any other accounting scheme, like how, how can we efficiently apply a, a discount rate or, or something that, that doesn't think of these things as distinct, but, but integrates the value of them in a way that is like, computationally efficient. Yeah, I think the key to recognize here is that we're actually trying to do precisely that of like, make the point that avoidance and removal are actually like two entirely different things. Like avoidance just means that the company is redu is doing something to reduce the amount of emissions that they are releasing and thus held liable for. And so the company is able to actually like, internally price like how much does it cost me to install i don't know more efficient ac units for example and reduce our emissions that way um versus if we just kept the same ac unit and just had to buy more removal offsets and so we're actually internalizing a lot of that um, rather than separately pricing what an avoidance offset costs or what a removal offset costs does that begin yeah. to answer your question I guess to add on real quick, uh, Lina, to yeah, to, to that point, we recognize that the term avoidance here is being used uh, maybe differently than it's been traditionally used uh, because we're focusing on the company and we're not focusing on um, for deforestation that would have otherwise occurred, for example. We're sticking to the company and the liability that they've created um, or that they will avoid creating um, when, we, when we say avoidance. Does that answer your question? I guess another way of, of phrasing it is what what prevents the perverse incentive of if I don't get money for an avoidance credit uh, because I, you know, I'd like to be paid for not chopping down my trees. I prefer to get paid for chopping down my trees and then planting new trees and farming in between. So there's obviously a bridge. I think it's hard to say that avoidance and removal are two different asset classes or categories, they're clearly related in incentives and there should be a financial mechanism that links them. Maybe it's just food for thought. Yeah, yeah we, we agree. Ahead, yeah, yeah, sure. We, we agree and uh, noticed it and yeah, don't have a, a clear answer there. It is easier to handle removals than avoidance. I'm not sure if somebody, if one of the professors has comments on it. Yeah, let me, let me jump in very briefly because this is a, an ongoing debate amongst uh, all of us. Um, if, if you think about, first of all, avoidance versus an incurred liability, it's a very different accounting exercise. Like one is a forecast and one is things that have happened. But more importantly is if we're doing carbon accounting correctly, then if I say I need to cut down a whole lot of trees to plant my uh, cacao plants, then I just incurred a whole lot of, of carbon emissions liabilities in order to deliver to someone 
chocolate. And so like if, if we correctly attributed deforestation activity to a supply chain, it would be an expense or it would be um, a carbon emissions activity that has to be absorbed into a product. Um, so that's, that's probably the best way to think about linking the two is that if you have a product that causes deforestation in your supply chain, one could argue that's fine. You just have an obligation to undo it. The logical result though, is that you would have, you would end up with very, very expensive chocolate if you were correctly dealing with the emissions liability. I think one more point I might add on to that is like, it, it just ensures that someone is held liable. Like for example, if if deforestation is accounted for as a carbon stock, um, that would be another way we could go about it of like, either we can hold someone in the supply chain accountable, or we can hold someone accountable for protecting this carbon stock. Um, and either way, like, I, I think this is definitely an open question, but I do think there exists room within ELM to, to begin to tease out how to create that equivalence. Okay, great. I um, want to turn it over to Tom. I, I think what I do want to do at the outset is just offer um, to Bob and Mark, uh, who have been so deeply involved in, in, in this and working with the students, a bit of opportunity to comment, and then I will try and deliver in a shorter time than, uh, than 15 minutes, just some points that, that seem to me to characterize the problem as we're now seeing it, and, and most importantly, where we hope to take this work uh, in collaboration with 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 those of you who are um, uh, watching on the on the gallery, um, but also with a number of other people who have have interested uh, indicated um, a, a very strong interest in seeing this work go forward. Mark, do you want to pick up first, and then Bob? I'll ask Bob the same question um, on your sense of of where we are and and um, and and where we're going to go from this uh, initial. Practicum? Uh, sure. So I, I think the, the, one of the core messages that we're trying to get at is understanding how we can possibly move from a voluntary regime to a compliance regime. And one of the important underlying steps to that is getting accounting working in a reasonable and effective way. Um, and first and foremost, that means understanding um, embodied emissions and emissions in a supply chain and constructing uh, e-liabilities. This is a very different approach than scope one, scope two, scope three. At, at, in, a, in, in the most generous uh, view, we could call it um, correctly reporting scope one, um, understanding how scope two arrives at my doorstep and then dealing with uh, upstream scope three emissions. But if, it, it, as I think we all agree, in the long run or in the intermediate run, we need something that's a compliance regime, not a voluntary regime. And um, compliance about hypothetical future things such as downstream emissions is just never, at least in this country, in a, in a fit in a compliance regime. So then we're left saying, well, you know, what do we do once we understand the emissions? It's construct a liability. And once we construct a liability, then in many ways, the assets necessary to match that liability sort of all fall into place. Um, the question is, are you removing the damage you are doing? Are you undoing the, the, the damage of your emissions? Are you recapturing the CO2? However you want to go about doing that, just internalize it. We're internalizing it with an endogenous price based off the cost of removals, and that price will fall. This gets us around the difficult debates around social cost of carbon, since we're simply saying, you know, if you want to emit the carbon, emit the carbon, just pay the price to remove it. Um, and like one of the things we're um, 
find we, we think is most attractive about this system is it sort of puts every, as, as one of the people we've been talking to at a corporate says, we have the only system that sort of puts everything in a nice box, puts a bow on the box and says, here's exactly what you need to do. And we can do it in a, in a voluntary regime. We can also move it to a compliance regime. And that's why you know, we're excited about this different approach. And with that, I'll pass the baton. Bob, yeah. you wanna just um, sum up where, how you're looking at where we're heading with all this? Yeah, well, I come at it uh, maybe from a little bit of a you know higher level perspective, focusing on pricing carbon, and and from that perspective, what makes the, the these markets so interesting is that they're the ones that are you know in some sense the cheapest if we can get them uh, to become real. Uh, so if we can address the issues of additionality, permanence, leakage, and so on, and and create a commodity which is carbon flux that can be measured and uh, you know, reported, verified, audited, and so on, uh, all of which requires, I think, governments to get involved. And I think that's something that everyone here agreed on. Uh, so I think it's very important that we move quickly. And that's, that's one of the issues here. We've got to move quickly in terms of pricing carbon. And if this is going to be the market that's going to move first, because it's the one that's able to scale at the lowest cost, uh, then we have to address all these issues. So I congratulate you and all the students who have done a remarkable job of tackling these difficult and complex issues. Thanks. So, so let me just uh, sum up quickly um, and, and, and uh, build on what, what people have said. I, I'm sitting here in Singapore right now, as, as some people know. Uh, yesterday, I, I spent a good bit of time with, uh, with, with the largest bank in the region um, and their sustainability officer. And the message that he gave to me is about what he's being asked by clients, I, I think is at the heart of everything we're saying. He basically said every client he has is coming to him, corporates, financials, anyone, and saying, um, help me to set up um, myself as, as an issuer of, of, of carbon credits. Um, I, I want to, everything that, um, that, that, that we can do to enhance sustainability, um, we want to sell into this market. And, and the protestation from the bank is that, that it can't work that way. You can't sell everything uh, into these carbon markets, but that's absolutely not what clients want to hear. Uh, they, they, they simply, they, if, if I were to describe the penetration um, into Asia of, of carbon activity, it's how can we sell whatever we're gonna do to, uh, to, to some, uh, unnamed buyer, usually in another part of the world, um, who is going to pay us to, to, to take whatever steps, whether it's reducing our energy uh, emissions or, or, or protecting um, our, our, our carbon stocks. Um, and, but this is not just in the private sector. I mean, it, the, the discussion that we had a bit earlier about uh, the the, uh, the carbon credits for for uh, accelerated coal reduction um, in in, uh, in in much of the world in Chile and Indonesia, but uh, focusing for the moment in Indonesia, it's that as we have seen um, interest rates rise and uh, and and uncertainties about an energy transition take place that that make governments cautious about closing down. Uh, proven technologies and and institutionalizing large scale uh, unproven uh, systems. Uh, what 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 is what is generally happening is that um, these changes, which at one point were being justified simply as a custodial problem, as as the as our our group described where it was simply going to be cheaper to do renewable energy and the cost of capital that was included in, in, in power purchase agreements was very high. 
So you were just going to restructure um, and change ownership um, in order to, to shift from high fossil fuel use to, to low carbon. That gradually has, has, has changed and the underlying transaction is not going to be done on a voluntary basis. So everybody began looking for commercial for, for concessional finance from governments. But as governments in the West began to say, gee, where is this where is this concessional finance going to come from? The banks are not seeming to be willing to put it up in any magnitude. Um, now we see everybody substituting carbon markets for concessional finance. So both in the public and private sector, there are deep instabilities here. And the fundamental problem that I have heard discussed again and again today, and certainly in our concentrations going forward, um, has to do what is the relationship between these markets and, and, and a system that adds up to something like the uh, objectives and goals that we have created that are represented by global carbon budgets. Um, and the problem is, is just a bit of a Gresham's Law problem uh, in the sense that if we have decentralized issuances of currencies um, uh, that, that are, are uh, invariably, we don't see any financial flow unless there are offsets, people are only paying to substitute one carbon emission for, for another, um, then this can't possibly add up and there has to be a relationship that's being represented by both what Mark and Bob said, um, which is that that governments are going to um, become active here um, to prevent both the the inflation tendencies that we're currently seeing in the market for carbon markets now with um, endless issuers, but in effect. Um, there has to be some relationship that we have never been able to establish adequately since we started dealing with carbon in, in 1992 uh, at, at a global level. There has to be some kind of a, an allocation process between what countries are, are doing um, when they make pledges, whether these are net zero pledges, or that, which is the most current version of, of, of country commitments, and the allocation of that budget. Um, and I think this is becoming even more complicated because if we look at what countries are doing, they are essentially saying we're going to overshoot any reasonable allocation of the global carbon budgets that would come to our country by combusting more fuels over the next period of time, combusting more fossil fuels um, than any reasonable estimate of our allocation. Uh, but how are we going to deal with that? We're going to essentially use nature-based removals through forestation, reforestation and, and afforestation to make up for our fossil fuel overshoot. In effect, they are nationalizing um, the, the, the nature-based removals. And so they can't be available for, uh, for private sale through exchanges. Um, any more than than nationalized oil stocks or nationalized gold stocks uh, could be available for private sale um, by those who, who who don't really own them. So we we're in a, a very difficult position where we do have lots of measurement and R and V structures, but the government structure is not there. So just to to wrap the whole thing up and and make a plea to all of you who are listening and those who will listen for engagement in this work, we need to answer two questions. One is every time we think about e-liabilities or, e, uh, or, or ELM management, people say it's too late to shift. Uh, the world is running down the current track with greenhouse gas accounting. Um, and, and the only thing that we can say is whatever else is happening, the instabilities in the carbon markets that we are describing here, um, are going to be one source of suggestion that the track we are on is not necessarily the track that we can successfully follow. And I think this question of the instabilities of the carbon market has to stand for a larger set of instabilities in accounting and in some of the measures that we're about to see occur um, with regard to carbon border adjustments that are going to destabilize the current system and make something like ELM um, a, a necessary structure. Um, and the very last remark in the in the last 
60 seconds, um, is that there are three great challenges. The biggest challenge is getting countries in the world and, and to recognize that there are liabilities here. We are not talking about voluntary games uh, in any successful pathway. And we have some interesting idea about how to manage those liabilities. Uh, they may involve time-limited securities or that for carbon markets um, and, and forward-looking curves uh, that, that, that can be managed in other segments of the capital markets, uh, like pension benefit trusts. But, be, but beyond that, the standing trees problem and the coal problem, particularly in Asia, uh, where the vintages of, of, of coal plants are very young and not amortized, do need to be treated. The point is that they cannot be treated through offsets and still make this work, at least as offsets are currently involved. Um, there will have to be other forms of income transfers and support, and those are very much a part of our project as well. So with that summary of where this is going, and again, a repeat of my plea that, that we gather as much of a community as possible to look at particular instantiations of these issues, um, let me turn it back to Alicia to just close us off. That was terrific. Thank you, Tom. Uh, really appreciate that summary. And thank you all. Thank you to our uh, audience members. Thank you to our students for the great presentations. Uh, this is recorded. We will make it available. We also will have the slides and a final report. Uh, and we invite you to join us on this journey. Thank you all. Have a good night.